Hi, welcome to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Veera, Season 3. This season has been shaping up so well. We've had 14 guests who specialize in different music realms ranging from jazz fusion to blues, Latin pop, and even Bollywood. For the first time, there's rock, hip-hop, dance hall, and reggae music. These include three festival and concert edition podcasts for the Mahindra Blues Festival, Oddball, and Scott Henderson's Bangalore Tour. This season promises to bring in the best music interview podcasts like never before. I really would like to take a moment to appreciate everyone's support, everyone who's been diligently watching all of these episodes and if you haven't subscribed you know what to do you can subscribe to my youtube channel follow me on spotify or apple podcasts and you can feel free to leave an honest review about the show so the past couple of weeks have been very eventful and here's a sneak peek of some of the concerts i attended over the past couple of weeks starting with tigran hamasian live from the Oddball Festival that happened at the Phoenix Market City in Bengaluru on the 24th February The second concert I got to attend was called India Jazz Up, featuring Thilo Kurtu, Paolo Frazu, and Rita Marcotulli. It happened at a wonderful auditorium called the Prestige Sri Hari Kodi Center. You gotta check out a sneak peek of this video. It'll blow your mind. After the concert, I also got to meet these maestros backstage and personally invite them to be part of the podcast. We'll find out shortly if they'll be able to make it. Next up, I was specially invited by Swaminathan Selva Ganesh, who's the grandson of the legendary Vikku Vinayak Ram of Shakti. He invited me to check out a very exclusive rehearsal session for the Mahindra Percussion Festival, which happened in Bangalore, featuring his Gautam Symphony Orchestra. And here's a glimpse of the same.
this happened on the 22nd march 2024 never in my wildest dream did i imagine that i'd be seeing a gutam symphony live and that to viku ji of shakti curating it it's it's just i i just need to pinch myself to believe that this this happened right i got to attend day 1 and day 2 of the mahindra percussion festival here's a video from day 2 of the mahindra percussion festival featuring tofik ji's group surya that featured abhi and i am pali on guitar shikhar khureshi on drums and percussion sarang kulkarni on the sarod and kaushiki joglekar on keyboard this video is just extraordinary so this was the headliner set on day 2 After day one of the Mahindra Percussion Festival, Vikku Ji's Gatam Symphony Orchestra was easily the highlight for me. Post the concert, I got to meet them backstage. Uh, this time, I got to meet Uma Shankar Ji, who is Vikku Ji's son, and uh, I also got to personally greet Vikku Ji for uh, everything he's been doing for generations now. and uh, yeah there's, there's a third generation which is ongoing his grandson is spearheading this movement felt so nice watching all of them and another lady very interesting per- personality probably one of the first gatam players in india who's viku ji's disciple again sukanya ram gopal so i got to interact with them for a couple of hours and it was a surreal experience After Surya's headlining set at the Mahindra Percussion Festival on day 2, I had the chance to personally meet Taufik ji and he was delighted to finally meet me after our interaction on on this year's podcast episode for the Mahindra Percussion Festival which will be coming out very shortly. Last weekend I got to witness a two day extravaganza curated by NCPA I'm talking about the National Center for the Performing Arts Mumbai and they were in Bangalore for the very first time they had uh, the Symphony Orchestra of India on day one who mesmerized me by playing couple of their standard classical tunes that featured Mozart symphonies uh Bach symphonies and uh the highlight of of the evening for me was when they played the harry potter medley uh, it, it was it was for close to about 5 minutes and they did it in their own inimitable style it was just fabulous and uh post that they played the, the pirates of the caribbean medley followed by a lot of bollywood indian mashup tunes uh which had uh, a couple of popular numbers and they close they set by playing uh, ar rahman's jai ho what a night and later they had uh, the unerased poetry featuring three incredible poets who did their routines from different parts of the country day 2 of ncpa at the freedom park was even better the evening opened with an odissi dance performance by the srajan ensemble The performance included improvised movements from the Natya Shastra. It had uh, a tribute to Adi Guru Shankara Acharya, a depiction of the image of Shiva and Parvati. Some of the rags in terms of the music that were used were in Kirwani Madhurima, 
and the Adi Tal Jati. Their coordination together as a unit was impeccable. And some of the formations and the mudras that they were trying to showcase left me spellbound. The evening just didn't end with the Odyssey dance performance, but there was Darren Das who would put up a wonderful musical night for all of us, making us shake a leg with retro and dance numbers, a lot of ABBA, Bonium, and uh, even Brian Adams. So he made us dance the night away. I'd like to give my friend Ashish Gatak a very special shout out for putting together a wonderful autobiography of Shankar Mahadevan Ji. This book is called The Musical Maverick. As you can see, a lot of attention to detail has gone even in terms of designing the cover of the book. The pink and the black color schemes blend in so well together. And I haven't heard of many Indian writers write autobiographies of our Indian musical contemporaries in the past couple of years. So kudos to Ashish for putting in so much effort, so much time in terms of understanding a subject and coming up with this wonderful autobiography. So to show him your love and support, the best way you can do it is by Picking up a copy of the book, you'll find it at a landmark store all over the country. Or if you're a fan of Kindle, there's a Kindle edition too. If you'd like to purchase the book online, you can always go to an Amazon.in and pick up your personalized copy of The Musical Maverick by Ashish Gatak. Speaking of my guest today, he's none other than Chief Ajua. He was formerly known as Christian Scott and he's a Grammy-nominated musician, composer, producer. He's renowned for his innovative approach to jazz. He's released numerous critically acclaimed albums including the groundbreaking Stretch Music series and the Centennial Trilogy. He reimagines jazz in the context of contemporary social and political issues and he does his best through his music. Chief Ajua's signature techniques such as the whisper technique and the forecasting cell redefine traditional jazz conventions. He's also a pioneer in genre blending fusion jazz with trap, West African and New Orleanian Black Indian masking traditions. His achievements include Grammy nominations, Edison Awards, and the Jazz FM Innovator of the Year Award for the Stretch Music app. He's collaborated with several many artists that include Prince, Tom York, Saul Williams, and many more. His impact extends beyond music through his community service and advocacy for human rights. His dedication to decolonizing sound and uplifting communities solidifies his legacy as a visionary in the world of music and activism. So without any further ado, I'm delighted to welcome my guest for today, Chief Ajua. This is Chief Ajua, and you're listening to Star Words of Music with the Aditya Vira. Hi, Chief. Namaste. Hey. Welcome Namaste. to Star Words of Music with Aditya Vira. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show, sir. Uh, thank you for having us. Incredible. So I have a couple of interesting questions uh, coming your way. But before we get started, where are you right now? What's happening? Uh, I'm home, actually, in my uh, in my house and in, in one of my music rooms. This is the electronic room. 
Uh-huh. I have uh, you know a bunch of gear and different things, and uh, write and ideate uh, some things from here. Okay. And then I have an acoustic room that has a bunch of really old drums from all over the world and different sounds that I I, I compose from as well. Marvelous, marvelous! Looks beautiful. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. That's such a pretty <laughs> sight <laughs> from. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Looks looks like an antique room with some incredible oh. uh, instruments and everything that you've uh, beautifully placed. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, these ones get beat up every day. All right. All right, Chief, uh, let's start with our agenda. So my first question for you would start with the whole idea. If you had to explain your musical style in simple terms to the listeners of my show, how would you mm-hmm. describe the traditions and influences you personally embody? Is there a specific genre or roots associated with your music? Yeah, the the root of the music comes from the New Orleanian perspective, um, you know, and the and the and the the cultures that are tethered to African systems of retention in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Um, I come from a tribal chieftain system in New Orleans, from the Maroons of Louisiana, and and the chieftain of a tribe or a nation referred to as Shotokan, which essentially means the unity. Mm. Uh, so I, I grew up in a, a very specific kind of culture and household that was really responsible for maintenance of the skeleton keys of the types of expressions that eventually became known as blues or jazz and these sort of things. So so okay. our sort of artistic contribution um, sort of rests in the very beginning of these things coming from Africa and, be- and eventually becoming American forms, mm-hmm. but it predates all of those things, right? Mm. Mm. So, so our rooted the the rootedness and and our expression actually comes from the actual root okay. of, of which most people would call American music. That's rock and roll, jazz, all of the different things. Um, but it is intentional about trying to grab as many languages and as many vernacular and approaches to music as possible to sort of unify everyone under one larger definition that deals with the human being not mm-hmm. the tribesmen or this this nation's person or this ethnic identity but okay. the human being's capacity to be able to share sound um as a means of being able to move forward as a larger society that acknowledges the validity and and the uh, beauty and all of the perspectives of human beings not just one race class or cult so that's a so sort of genre blindness in music but from the rooted uh afro-american perspective i i see where you're coming from there's very rich musical heritage and you're trying to embody the highest aspirations of someone who'd like to take these traditions forward. Pretty mm-hmm. incredible because we don't see a lot of them. Uh, you know, in fact, I was having a conversation last week with someone. And uh, in fact, it was, it, was, it was Shaggy. And Shaggy was asking me, do I, do I know my great grandparents? Do I know the roots uh, of how, where my ancestors came from? And do I know a lot about them? I don't. Mm-hmm. But you seem to be quite well informed. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, I mean, you know, we 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 in my and my family culture and the tribes culture. Yeah. There are um they have actively worked to 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 remember and to hold on to as much of that as possible. Mm-hmm. But I would say in in the larger New Orleanian culture, yeah. there, I don't know that it's that specific. I think that there is a a um a large collective cultural memory that exists there because the expressions never stop. That mm-hmm. also tethers you to your history a little bit differently because they're yeah. still singing the same songs, Correct. right? Correct. So, so, so it 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 can be very cool, uh, you know, to grow up in a space where they're that intentional about retaining those kinds of histories. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, I was I was so curious to learn more about your heritage and uh, i saw a lot of information on the internet and uh, i i noticed that there is a very special chief ajua bo and, yeah. and and why i would like to understand why you felt the need to devise a new instrument musical oh, yeah. traditions have witnessed a wide range of musical instruments and styles and approaches so why mm-hmm. a new one well it's um firstly i I'd, I'd say it's 
we live in an era where the the prevailing wisdom mm-hmm. uh, has been that everything everything that's been created that exists in a musical instrument and forum is already perfect and exists in that and there's nothing should be changed, right? So yeah. as an example, when I go into a Yamaha to take a meeting about building new trumpets, they don't want to change any of the designs because to them it's perfect, right? But I can tell you as the practitioner that plays at a level that's different from the average guy buying a trumpet, it's not, <laughs> right? And so it's, it, it again, it, it always... Um, it's been baffling and sort of mind blowing to me how limited uh, we can, our vision can be. Um, and for me, I think it's important to embrace possibility. Um, I don't, I, I, I think in order for kids in 22, in the 23rd and 24th century to be interested in music, uh, we're going to have to create instruments at a minimum that touches the kinds of environments that they will probably be touching, right? So it's like, as much as I love the cornet, um, I don't know that the utility of that instrument stays the same in 200 years, right? Mm. It, it didn't really make it past the 20th century. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, right? So, yeah, so yeah. firstly, and then the second thing I would say is also, in the West, we we have... Uh, uh, this sort of energy and this idea that says that if you are valid as a musician, you play these instruments. Okay. Okay. And, and if you are, and if you are not generally, you play the instruments that we would associate more with like ethnomusicology. Right. Mm, mm. So, um, but that is still the same sort of value distinction that says better, worst, good, bad, right, wrong, all of these things. And in music, that context doesn't actually exist. Right. So it's important for us to build new things because we also need to subvert and challenge those kinds of ideas and levy our non-acceptance um, to energies that essentially say that they get to determine what is and is not valuable. Right. Well, uh, of course, I, I agree with the fact that this thought was put into uh you know someone's head when they started learning the instrument uh by what is convention by what what are like the standards but mm-hmm. what i am interested in knowing is was there something you wanted to express through your music which the existing set of instruments could not capture yes absolutely yeah it, the the ingoni culture kora culture simbi culture bolong culture these instruments that were mixed into this this new instrument uh, is a hybrid of all of those different instruments from the West African canon. Those instruments are the seeds of of what eventually turned into the blues in America, right? That mm. sound, that the sound, yeah, uh, does not start in America, right? Mm. That sound starts in Africa and West Africa, Africa okay. right? Okay. Um, there, there are vestiges of those sounds in other parts of Africa. When I listen to Zydeco music in Louisiana, it sounds frighteningly similar to Tanzanian music. Uh, to Ugandan music, music of areas in Madagascar. So, so it's not to say exclusively West Africa, but this is where the largest pocket of people expressing that way that we know in this moment actually exists. But my point is that you, the approach to blues in the 21st century completely um, walks away from its actual rooted history. I, mm-hmm. And this is part of where we started the conversation with being a part of the actual roots, not the roots that made it to Westerners' narratives about where the music comes from, right? Yeah. Which, which, which are narratives that have been redacted so okay. that certain energies are not um, projected, right? Because mm-hmm. there's a danger in that, you know. If if I'm um, if I, I'm speaking to uh, where the blues actually comes from. Uh, uh, where the, the folks that were holding on to uh, the sort of um, energy of the expressions in the Americas that eventually turned into forms like jazz and rock and roll. Those are radical forms of music and they come, they generally come from people that are radical, mm. <laughs> right? So, so that, that is not the narrative that you've been given of the, of the, the singular narrative that you've been given of, of this music comes from, uh, from from plantations and from churches, and they mix those things, and then it became that narrative has massive holes in it because those spaces are not spaces where people are holding on to the kinds of rhythms and harmony that exist in Africa. <laughs> those are places that are that are are traditionally 
uh, reservoirs for a very specific type of dehumanization at the hands of colonial agents. That it's not a, there's not a space for radicalness. So it, anyone that actually takes a closer look at it would be able to say that, yeah, okay, that I, it makes sense that some threads come from those environments, but this music sounds radical to me. So who are the radicals? <laughs> if you find those people in Louisiana, historically, those are people that were maroons and that were running away and that were creating their own spaces and territories and that were saying, you cannot dehumanize me or levy the fact that I am uh, levy any sort of vestige of a perception of inferiority to me because I'm not inferior. I'm actually, in some cases, you're looking around and you're saying, I'm all the things. So <laughs> so, so the music comes out of those energies. So I needed to be able to, to be able to compel in those ways. I had to create a tool that allowed me to access and channel through ancestral recall and memory, those energies. And it doesn't exist on this, it, right? It, 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 it exists here once uh, Musicians like Freddie Keppard and Buddy Bolden and uh, Kid Ori and Louis Armstrong get their hands on this. Yeah. But preceding that, that wasn't this, <laughs> right? It was this kind of thing, you know, in Ngoni culture. This is a uh, this comes from a very specific kind of cultural purview that is is not taking any shit, for lack of a better way of putting it. Mm. How popular is this instrument becoming? Are, are you the sole proponent of the chief Ajua Bo? And, and you, said, you said you yeah. said two hundred years later, would yeah. we get to see a school of musicians playing the Chief Ajua Bo? I think you'll be able to see that in less than a decade. Uh, that's mm-hmm. going to happen soon. Yeah, the kids, all of the kids want the instrument. We're just uh, building it in a way to where we can offer it either to give it away in a lot of instances and also offer it at a, a, a price point that makes sense for young people that are coming from communities that are that don't have the resources to be able to pay. You know, like, you know, the first prototypes that I built for these instruments are upwards of $17,000, $20,000 for prototypes. So obviously it shouldn't be the expectation that a 10-year-old kid pay that much for an instrument. We want to try and get it to the space to where we can sell them for $100, right? Mm. So... So that is re- has required some work, and we're still actively working on it. But I, I feel confident in the within the next five to ten years, it'll be an instrument that you see as much as you see, you know, an acoustic bass or a trombone. But there will be the idea is that there will be a fleet of of, of all kinds of instruments, not just Ajua's bow, but all kinds of ones that are designed to play together. Mm. You know. Mm. And speaking of yet another significant instrument would be the Chief Ajua's trumpet. So you've made substantial changes in the instrument itself. So what kind of changes did you make? Yeah, let me see if I can. Let me grab that one so I can show you. Okay. So this instrument is is essentially a flugelhorn or a cornet type instrument. Mm. It's conical, which means from the end of the valve block, the instrument is constantly getting larger. Right, which softens the sound a bit. We created two deep shepherd's crooks here and here as well, wow. which allows you to get a little bit more resistance so it opens up the upper register. Traditionally, on a, a flugelhorn, the range is very small compared mm. to a trumpet. So, we needed to try and figure out a way to be able to adjust a bit, those types of instruments to be able to still get the same range, if not a larger range than the trumpet, right? So it has an incredibly dark and sweet sound, but also it's designed basically to be a bully as well. Um, this one actually, as a receiver, can take a trumpet, flugelhorn, or a cornet mouthpiece. That's a trumpet mouthpiece. Um, and the receiver is actually uh, integratable in that you can actually take it out and make adjustments and do different things. So Lovely. So a uh, Different uh, sort of advents. I'll, I'll also, the bore size is extremely large on this instrument. So, you know, very different from a trumpet, a flugelhorn, or a cornet. Once you actually play, you know. Well, you should uh, you should definitely uh, send some of those to India. We'll have oh, like man, a, that would enti- be great. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll have an entire battalion of uh, musicians uh, carrying these traditions forward <laughs> in our it. country. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. please. And you yeah. know, the thing is, like, we have to play there i have never played as a leader in india i play with other bands but never my own band it's crazy what are you waiting for I, i'm i'm, I'm here on a call for someone I'm, to call i'm right here i'm right here i would be more than happy to put you in touch with the best promoters in my country let's make it oh, happen man. chief yeah please yes actually yeah. the person that's on the um 
Um, what I'll do is when we leave, I'll give you my information and also Becca's information. Yes, she would be tripping that uh, that would be able to li- liaise between those folks. But we would love to come, you know. And and it's um it's it's a, actually kind of a travesty that we haven't been there because it's like I've always been such a huge fan of the culture and the music, even the dress style, all of it, the swag, yeah. all of it, right? So um you know I was uh. Uh, recently I, I ran into Anushka Shankar and we were talking about like favorite oh, movies, like Dev Das. And she was like, how do you know that? You know, <laughs> and so, you know, so Incredible. I think it would, yeah. it would be really, really great. You know, if we were fortunate enough to be able to get the opportunity to come in to be with the people there, that would be great. Well, I am going to be sure to sort of make this happen for you. Yeah. You. And that. I'd be more than happy to show you my country, host you. Oh, that would be great! Yeah, uh, feed you, feed you some nice Indian, uh, South Indian food because that's where I come from. Okay. And yeah, you'll you'll get a you'll get a beautiful uh, uh, free guided tour in in my country very it. soon. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love yeah. that. Yeah. You got to deal, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I love uh, it. So, Chief, uh, do you ever suffer from an identity crisis? Mm-hmm. You worked on over seventeen plus albums, from what I gathered. And you were formerly known as Christian Scott, and later you evolved into Chief Zion Atunde Ajua. Mm-hmm. Uh, multiple identities, mm-hmm. as I can see, uh, mm-hmm. for for each you know for each person listening to your music, they would perceive it in a certain way. Is there mm-hmm. a favorite identity among people? No. Well, the thing is, it's it's all to me the same identity. You know, it, it's yeah. I was born with that Western name when I became Chief the name and title changed, Uh right? But Mm -hmm. I'm also not a person that um, appreciates all the histories of how Black people in America got their names, (laughs) right? Right, right. (laughs) Held on to their surnames. That is a very evil, dark history. And one of my contentions is that one of the last lines of true emancipation is is to make sure that we also uh, liberate our names, Mm. right? but for me, I don't, um, I think people that know me, the funny thing is, is that I'm always the same and it doesn't matter what context you find me in. So they're, they're, yeah. I think a lot of people find it to be pretty fascinating that a person is that is actually so kind of steady yeah. actually has so many different ways you can refer to them. <laughs> right. So, so it's kind of an odd thing, but, but all of it has been a trajectory to the same thing. I do feel more comfortable uh, and prefer to be called either Chief Zion or Ajua. Um, mm-hmm. I don't like to be called Christian or Scott. Um, and legally, my name is no longer that as well. You know, makes sense. Makes sense. But from an identity perspective, nothing has really changed. Um, I think part of the reason this has been a harder thing and something that if people kind of have to wrap their heads around still is because it's take it actually took so long for me legally to change it. Mm-hmm. Because in Louisiana, you have to petition judges to do it. And the judges denied me for many years. One yeah. judge said that he wasn't going to allow me to advantage myself by having my own name. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, those are still the kind of battles that we're fighting as Black persons in America still. Um, and so I, I take pride in the name in a different way because it's also something that I had to fight for. Makes sense. Makes sense. Fair enough. You're a chief, Dane. And- ED of the Zodokan nation of New Orleans, and you embody this culture from what I've gathered. So I would like to understand how threatened in the long term do you feel the civilization you represent is, is going to be in? No, I don't, what think, situation? I don't, I don't think it's threatened at all. I think, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think this, uh, our culture has always been able to figure out how to survive and thrive no matter what was going around us. Okay. Uh, I think that's one of the, the positives about um, uh, living the experiences that these people have lived and survived and endured and also the relationship to ind- indigenousness and, and also understanding uh, the, 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 the land and, and actually, yeah. energy, you know, like, you know, most of the people that I surround myself with uh, and that are internation, they really understand um, the natural world to a, in a diff- to a different degree than other people. So 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 also when when things happen that are disruptive, mm-hmm. they uh, they don't get out of balance because they also understand that that's nature, <laughs> right? So yeah. so I, 
I think it it growing up in the the chiefdom system and the tribes it allows you to um to take a longer view of things. And so you don't you don't really get uh caught up so much in the day-to-day sort of uh minutia of of surviving the uh sort of American experience. They uh they they have a wider view. Lovely, lovely. That's incredible the way we you guys have been uh carrying this forward for generations yeah. and still still going on. Still on. Yes. Yeah. Still on. Yeah. The show must go on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So uh I would like to talk about your uh album which is uh Ancest- Ancestral Recall. Uh I would like to understand what was the underlying theme for this particular release. Well, oh, ancestral recall it just it, it 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 wasn't so much a theme for the release. It was really more of what happened when I was building the music. Okay, I was writing all these things that were kind of adjacent to my own cultural expression and trying to figure out new framings for them. And when I sent them out to other master level practitioners mm-hmm. to get some feelers for things I could do differently or things that they may want to contribute to, and this different things, the what was coming back was staggering everyone was saying hey this what you're doing here is like an initiated rhythm for like babalao in this culture what you're doing here is like a rhythm that's a rhythm for cultivators in in mali and the instruments that you're playing the rhythm on are the right is you're doing it how yeah. could you know that right and yeah. and and i hadn't had those experiences mm. so the only way that it could be B was that I was channeling something that was coming from other experiences in terms of what was what resides in this particular avatar. There's mm-hmm. other mem- and I've spent my life cultivating the ability to be able to kind of focus and tap in. So it made sense at that junction that that was what was going on. So once that once that became the prevailing theme and and, and the responses were calibrated in that way, the the concept for the overall album just started to fall into place. Lovely. I'd like to play a little bit of I Own the Night for the people of India. Okay, let's get it. <laughs> Thank you. 
one one last question for you in the interest of time uh, yeah. down in the distant horizon what would you like to be remembered as uh i don't know you know i think if 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 people remember uh our particular cohort or group of artists as a group that was intentional about um showing the world that we were better together than we've ever been apart and that's enough for me that's a, that's a beautiful that's a beautiful note so speaking of the whole concept of energy in one of your past conversations you did mention that it takes close to about thousands of hours for one to learn the art of moving energies inside a room and you've mm-hmm. mastered the art of achieving that feat without doing absolutely nothing right mm-hmm. so how do you envision this system of philosophy that is geared to personal transformation within you into social reality mm uh oh, it's, it's it's i think everyone as an individual has to be intentional about trying to figure out what energetically they are going to spend their time refining right i think it's, it's particularly for um when we think about your your culture and some of the theological and religious purviews that have come there and how they are calibrated to uh commencements and graduations as a human being and as a spirit right those are i think those things are beautiful ideas i think it just becomes about with that particular person uh elects to spend their time sharpening i don't feel that everyone needs to do that i don't think i don't yeah. think that's fair either uh but i do feel that as a society we would be in a better place if people were more um present right which requires the ability to be able to quiet certain things and you know so you know it it's it's really hard to say what is how to calibrate an entire one society around that versus a world society um mm-hmm. my thing would just be that um you know it took a very long time for me to develop the ability to be able to channel and process that and it and it also started with me being willing to learn deep to understand the tenets of meditation right mm-hmm. and not i have learned that can be useful for any human being yeah. but to get the to coerce a person into being willing to even try can be very difficult right sure. so so again i don't i don't know that the entire social calibration should be rooted around something that um that requires people actually sacrifice their time in a in a in a in a society that doesn't do that <laughs> right so we it's it so it, i really the best way to answer is to say i have i have no idea what the answer to that is you know i i just know what works for me and i've seen how those kinds of um people that develop the ability to be able to do that whether or not it's in a musical context of presentness and life context is another context maybe a a sport or a healer or whatever it is um generally the way they interact with others seems to be more radiant and light filled and with compassion and to me that that is the idea that i think energetically we should all be going for but in order to get into that space we're going to have to have some serious reformation as it relates to how we educate children as at a minimum because once a kid is 15 years old and they they've already deemed that that way of that system of thinking or being is not valid is very difficult to get them to change lovely lovely it's been such an incredible blessing honor and a privilege chief thank you so much for being a part of the show this interview will be additionally aired on big fm shillong and azol two incredible radio stations in the northeastern part of india and it'll also be on my youtube channel and other audio streaming platforms awesome oh uh, well i can't wait and i know that becca is going to reach out to be able to get the 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 audio of the recording as well because we're making yeah. a, ma- a major documentary and okay. they want to take bits and pieces of moments so if you're okay yes. with that great, yes yes can... certainly certainly i'd be happy to send the video also yeah oh that's perfect okay so let's do it stay in touch don't forget me right. no i got it and you can text me sure bye bye all right later on yeah bye.